one more encouragement before we jump into this story. Um, I, love, I love the Word of God. I love reading the Bible. And I've been studying this Bible for so many years. I, I, I didn't even want, I didn't, I don't, I don't even know how many. But how many of you have ever come across a story in the Bible as you're reading, and you're like, huh? Right? I mean, don't most of us, as we're reading, we're just kind of read, 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 read. And you may get to a whole paragraph, a whole chapter of something that you didn't even understand. And what do you usually do? You just keep on reading, right? You just keep on going. Can I, I want to encourage you this morning. When you get to that point in reading the Bible, and listen, I do. I still do. But when you get to that point and you're like, what was that all about? Stop. Just stop and search it out. Come on, today we have no excuse. I remember when I first got saved, if you got to a portion of the Bible that you didn't really understand, you had to pull out a concordance. How many of you remember what a concordance? It's like that thick, and the print was like still that small, okay? Or you pulled out Matthew Henry commentary. How many of you know what that is? Six books, and or, or you hopefully had a Bible with, with, with commentary in it. And it was it was difficult. You could do it. It was difficult to really search out a matter. But today, honestly, now be careful. Today you come across something you don't understand. You could actually, I hate to say this in church, but you can actually Google it. Now be careful, okay? Be careful what you're reading. You know, look who the author of whatever article or whatever you Googled is, okay? If it's something funky, <laughs> pass it up. I think I told you when I was studying um, the palm trees. Now, I, I don't know nothing about palm trees, so I Googled palm trees. And there was one point that I had in the palm tree message. Palm trees break chains. Remember I was sharing you that? So I just, I, I don't believe everything I hear. So I Googled that. Is it really true that palm trees can break chains? I Googled that. And, man, there was about, I don't know, 10 to 12. I could have clicked on them. Different Christian pastors with messages on how palm trees break chains. So, so I could have gone to each one of them and got fed and, and, and got some knowledge. So I want to encourage you in this. Man, when you come across something you don't understand, stop and dig in. Amen? Because that's how this message came about this morning. And I've been reading the Bible for a long, long time. And I came across this parable and as I read it, I just read it through, and, uh, and I started to go on, and I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, back up. What was that all about? What was that all about? So I'm going to read you the parable in a moment, but I want to set it up for you. It, it's a parable. It's in the Old Testament, so you were thinking it was already Jesus. No, it's in the Old Testament. It's a parable given by, given by a man by the name of Jotham, and he climbed to the top of Mount Gerizim, and he shouted, this and I'm going to read it. Hopefully, we'll have the words up there. Yeah, we, we had some issues this morning. They, they gave us a big, bright screen from the school, but now we're trying to figure out how we can use it. So, this guy climbs up to this mountain and he's got this parable that he gives to people. Now, here's what he says you can read along up there. Judges chapter 9, he says this Listen to me, citizens of Shechem. Listen to me if you want God to listen to you. Once upon a time, the trees decided to choose a king. Now, now pause there just for a minute. Disneyland's got nothing on the Bible, amen? Come on. We think, we think Disneyland has all this imaginative things, you know. It, most of Disneyland, how many of you know most of Disneyland is good versus evil? Star Wars, all of those things. And I love that this sounds like Disneyland when it starts off. Once upon a time, the trees decided to get together and have a talk. Come on, doesn't it sound like Disneyland? No. The Bible doesn't sound like Disneyland. Disneyland sounds like the Bible, okay, because the Bible was first, all right? So, so, so I'm reading this story. Once upon a time, the trees decided to choose a king. So they all got together, and first they said to the olive tree, be our king. But the olive tree refused, saying, should I quit producing the olive oil? That Now, now catch this phrase. Should I quit producing the olive oil that blesses both God and people, remember that, just to wave back and forth over trees? And then they said to the fig tree, you be our king. But the fig tree also refused, saying, should I quit producing my, my sweet fruit just to wave back and forth over the trees? 
And then they said to the grapevine, you be our king. But the grapevine also refused, saying, should I quit producing the wine? Listen to this again. Remember this one. Should I quit producing the wine that cheers both God and people just to wave back and forth over the trees? Then all the trees finally turned to the thorn bush and said, come, you be our king. And the thorn, thorn bush replied to the trees, if you truly want to make me your king, come and take shelter in my shade. If not, let fire come out from me and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So if you were reading that in your daily or weekly reading, what would you do at that point? You'd just keep on reading, right? How many of you, you really got something out of that? You're like, wow. Some of you are thinking, that would be a good Disney movie, right? Little trees running around talking and all kinds of things. I want to break this down. I want to break this down in a moment. And, and, and I, I want to show you what I think this parable is saying, what I think it's saying to us. Now, now before I break it down, I, I, I want to give you a point. This isn't going to make any sense at all. But I want to give you a point that's really not one of my points, but it will lead to the main point. <laughs> Did you follow all that? Okay. This isn't really a point, but it was something when I read it, I actually liked this part of the story. And here's what it is. I like the no in this story, the N-O. I like the no in this story. Will you be our king? No. No. Now, just be honest. You don't even have to raise your hands or anything else, but be honest. Will you be our king? Will you be our king? Come on. What would you say? All the trees come up to you, and I'll, I'll explain the trees in a little bit. Would you be our king? Come on. I think most of us would be like, you betcha, <laughs> right? Most of us would be like, yes, certainly, certainly. And, and, and here's what I know about me, at least my problem. I would probably say yes, even if I didn't want to be their king. I would probably say yes, even if I didn't want to. You see, I've had in the past, I'm getting, I'm getting a lot better. My no is not that strong. How many of you know what I'm talking about, okay? My no is not that strong. I used to be, I'm getting a lot better, but I used to be really bad at saying no. I, I used to be terrible at saying no. Some of you are sitting out there, you're like, you don't even understand what I'm talking about. Somebody comes up to you and says basically, hey, could I do this? No. I didn't even finish that. No. <laughs> Some of you are like, you don't have a problem saying no. So you're like totally out there. You have no idea what I'm even talking about, okay? I struggled saying no. And it used to be very difficult. I'm getting better. I'm getting a lot better. I'm getting a lot better at it because here's what I've realized. I've learned, especially in ministry, but just in life. And how many of you know it is better to say no sometimes? Sometimes it's better to say no initially and come back and say, hey, you know what? That, that, you know, that was probably a really good idea. Why don't we go do, why don't we do that? Versus saying yes and having to come back and say, nah, I don't think we're going to do that. Come on, how many of you know that never goes well? That never goes well. So, so I'm learning this. I'm learning, I'm learning to say no. But as I was thinking about this message and thinking about that and thinking about myself, I'm like, where does that come from in me? Some of you are like, well, it's personality trait. It's this or that. And I was trying to figure it out. And some of it is, we talked about this with someone else. I hate drama. Man, I hate conflict. I run from conflict or drama. I don't think, and this is what I was examining, because here's why I'm leading into the point this morning. I don't think that I'm a pleaser. pleaser. Now, I know, now, I know uh, come on, all of us, in, uh, all of us, a little bit, we're all a little bit people pleasers, right? But I'm trying to examine this story in me, and, I, and I'm thinking, I'm not a people pleaser in the negative sense. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Because I don't really want to break all that down. I'm looking at myself thinking, I'm, we're all people pleasers, but I'm not really what I'd call a people pleaser in the negative sense. Now, now here's, here's the point I'm leading up to. As believers, if we're going to make a difference, we have to be more concerned with pleasing God than pleasing people. And as I read this parable, I began to see that's what this parable is really all about. That's what this parable is really all about. So, so let's look at it. I'm going to break it down, and then I'll give you three points on how to please God rather than people. So let's break down this parable. Number one, the Bible constantly, there's, there's lots of parallels. When you read something like this, 
Sometimes it's symbolic. Sometimes things aren't. But, but a lot of times, in the Bible, trees often represent people. Trees often represent people. So this parable could be about people, not just trees. How many of you have ever seen a tree walking around and talking to other trees? Okay? It probably hasn't happened. If you saw that happen, you need to get checked out. Okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. So, so this is probably representative of people. Because in the Bible, constantly it said that. So, so let's look at our story. The trees go looking for a king. And they come to the olive tree. They come to the olive tree and they ask him, Hey, would you please be our king? They ask him a question. Would you please be our king? And I love the olive tree. The olive tree answers their question with what? With a question. The olive tree answers their question with a question. And the olive tree answers back, Should I quit producing olives? Should I quit producing olives just to wave over all the other trees? Should I quit producing olives just to wave over all the other trees? And I'm sure he's thinking, King, your title sounds amazing. Oh, the, the, the box you want to put me in? Oh, that's, inc- you know, it probably comes with a promotion. It probably comes with some recognition, probably comes with some love. It probably comes with a lot of things. Man, it sounds, it sounds amazing. It sounds amazing. But if it means that I have to stop being me, nope, I don't want it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Here's the olive tree's response in this sense. Olive tree says this. And and I'm just going to paraphrase so you get a better understanding this morning, okay? Olive tree says, I produce olives. Olives. You know, you know, that stuff that you put on your pizza? Anybody else out there? Ah, I love olives on my pizza. That stuff you put in enchiladas? Nobody yet? All right. That stuff on Thanksgiving Day? Okay. That stuff that so many of the Perry kids just eat right out of the can, okay? The olive tree is like, man, I make those. I produce those. And and the olive tree is like, and if that's not enough, I produce those olives. And people take those olives and they press them. And they get this oil out of them, olive oil. And the olive tree is like, they press my olives and they make olive oil, which... They use for everything. Come on. It's like, man, they use olive oil for everything. For everything. You want me to give that up? You want me to give that up? Just because you want me to do something. You want me to give that up just because you want me to do something else. No. It's just like, nope. And the scriptures, I love it, the scripture says, they move on. They move on. And, and this, this is a side note, okay? But I want you to notice this. They keep moving on. They keep moving on. Listen, and, and, and here's what I want you to get out of this. They keep moving on until they find somebody that will do what they want done. Listen, it's not about you. It's not about you. Man, sometimes we can get so enamored by the, by the praise and the compliments of people. But the reality is, if you say no, or if things don't work out the way they want, guess what? They're moving on. They're moving on. They're moving on. Listen, it happens in business. It happens in business all the time. They hire a manager in to turn things around, and things don't get turned around, and guess what? They move on. They move on. Um, it happens in church. It happens in church. All the, listen, not, not, just, not just ignite every church. You get people coming to church and they're like, pastor, I want you to be our pastor. I want ignite church to be our church. And then how, something happens. They're offended. You don't say something they like. And what do they do? They just move on. They move on. Listen, it happens in sports. It happens in sports all the time. A lot of professional coaches, professional football at least, a lot of times when they're going to hire a coach, they'll go to the college ranks. And a lot of times, a lot of college coaches turn them down. A lot of college coaches say, nah, I don't want to coach in the NFL. And what do they do? They just move on. They just move on. 
Let's just move on. Listen, it happens in almost every occupation that there, that there is in relationships. Come on, not right, but in relationships, things didn't work out the way they want. See you. Moving on, moving on. So in this story, they, they move on to someone else. They move on to someone else. They move on to another tree. Now they get to the fig tree. I don't even know much about fig trees. Okay, I'm learning about fig trees. I know this is like the month of the tree, I guess. I, I don't know what happened, okay? But so, so these guys come to the fig tree. These other trees come to the fig tree. Hey, fig tree. And this is basically what they say. And I'm breaking it down. Hey, fig tree. You're not quite as important as the olive tree. And honestly, is it? Come on, help me out here. Fig Newtons. I love Fig Newtons, right? I love Fig Newtons, okay? I know there's a Christmas song that says something like, so bring us some figgy pudding. That's so bring. How many of you have ever had figgy pudding? Hey, there's a couple. Is it a southern thing? English thing. Okay. I've never had figgy pudding. Okay. So fig newtons and figgy pudding. That's, a, I don't know. That's about it. Right. That's about it. So, so it's almost as if the fig tree isn't really as important as the olive tree or even the grapevine. And we'll see that in just a moment. Okay. So they come to the fig tree and they're like, Hey man, you're not as important. You're not really as valuable. You're, you're not as valuable as the olive. People don't desire you as much as the olive tree or, or even the grapevine. So will you take this position? Come on, you take this position? Oh, it'll take you from here to here. You, you, come on, you won't just be that, that little fig tree. You will be king. Think about it, king. Think about it, king. And I, I, Man, I, I, out of all the trees, I think I love the fig tree's answer the best. He knows he's not as, as desirable as an olive tree or the grapevine. And notice, I had, you, I had you catch those phrases I was reading in the story. Notice he doesn't say, should I stop producing my figs that bless or cheer both God and man? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. The olive tree said that. The olive tree said, should I stop making my olives that cheer God and man? The, the, the grapevine said, should I stop producing the wine that cheers God and man? The fig tree, here, here's the thing about the fig tree. The fig tree knows I'm not that good. I'm not that good. But I know I'm good enough to not take a lesser role than what God has assigned to me and be in your king. See, he knows, yeah, maybe I'm not as desirable as the olive tree. Maybe I'm not as productive as the, as the grapevine. But, he listens, but he's like, but I know who I am. And I'm not about to take a lesser role than what God has called me to do just to wave over trees. Just to wave over trees. That's for some of you this morning, man. Yeah, the, the enemy will come to you and say, man, why don't you just take this position? You need to do what God has called you to do. And we'll get to that point in just a moment. I'm jumping way ahead, okay? You have to know who and what God made you to be and what he's assigned you to do. And as I read this story, I'm loving the fig tree. It's like, he knows who he is. He knows who he is. And listen to me. If you don't know who you are in Christ, you may just try to take on an assignment that God hasn't assigned to you. No, I'm not going to give that up. I'm not going to stop producing my figs. That's what he says. So they move on. Grapevine. And then I'll get to my points. Last one. They move on to the grapevine. Grapevine, be our king. Grapevine, just like, nope. Nope. And... Some of you might struggle with the grapevine's answer, but it's scripture, so let me just read it. Should I stop producing the wine that cheers both God and man? I don't know where that fits in your theology, but just remember this is just a parable, okay? It's just a parable, all right? So, so, so let me kind of get you refocused, look at it a different way. Look at it this way. You want me to give up doing what pleases God and makes him happy? <laughs> Think of it that way. Hey, be our king. Grapevine re replies with, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want me to stop doing what pleases God and what makes him happy? Just to come wave over trees? Just to come do something that may look good, may look important, may look great? 
stop doing what I was created to do? Grapevine's like, no way. Not me. So you ready? That's the story. Here we go. Three points to maybe help us please God more than man. Taking notes, here's the first one. You can write it down if you want. It should be up on the screen. Yeah. Never choose a title over a calling. Never choose a title over a calling. Um, Ignite Church, when we first started the church, you know, and, and any church when they first start, I think there's always that discussion, hey, what do we call the pastor? What do we call the pastor? Um, different denominations, they may call them um, Apostle, Apostle Fred, uh, Bishop George, um, help me out here. Reverend, Reverend so-and-so. And listen, listen, I'm not picking on any bishop so-and-so. Listen, I'm, and I'm going to explain all this, but I'm not picking on any of those, okay? But here's what I want you to understand. Some of you that are here this morning, some of you call me Pastor Troy. Some of you just call me Troy. I'm, I'm totally, completely honest here. I don't care. Okay? I really don't. I mean, as long as you call me something nice, I really don't care what you call me, okay? If you call me Pastor Troy, that's great. If you just call me Troy, that's great. I, I, we, were, we were somewhere once, and, and they asked, went around the room, some, something, and, and, and so I, I, I announced myself as, as Pastor Troy, and later someone said, yeah, but are you the senior pastor? And I'm like, I'm 58. That's pretty close, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, it's like, no, no, here, here's my point. Here's my point, okay? If someone calls me Troy, if someone calls me Pastor Troy, guess what? I am still the pastor of Ignite Church either way. Right? Come on. I am still the pastor of Ignite Church Either way, and at least for me, here's the cool part about that. I'm the pastor of Ignite Church, not because the elders elected me, not because the deacon board voted me in. Honestly, I am the pastor of Ignite Church because God did this. I didn't even apply for the job, okay? God did this. God did this. And listen, listen to me. In case you think I'm bragging or anything else, I'm also aware of the fact that God could remove me faster than any Eldens or any deacon board could, okay? So I'm conscious of that fact. But listen, God did this. God did this. So, so for me, it doesn't matter if Troy, Apostle Troy, Bishop, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, none of that even matters. But now, now listen to me. Don't throw titles out the window. And that's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm not telling you to throw titles out the window. And if you go home today and your brother or sister goes to a church and they're, they call their pastor the bishop or reverend or, or apostle, so on, don't be like, hey, my pastor said you shouldn't do that. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Titles, in many ways, titles are good, right? There's a, so they're important. I'm not trying to, do, listen, if, you, if I go to the doctor, oh, I want to see DR. <laughs> in front of his name, right? Come on. In fact, I want to see DR, and if I see a whole bunch of other things, like Pastor Emmanuel, if I see a whole bunch of other things, I'm like, yes, yes, right? So I'm not dismissing titles. I'm not saying that they're not important, okay? But here's my point in this. Your titles, your title should describe your calling. Your title should describe your job, your title should describe what you're supposed to be doing. You following me? If I go to a doctor and he has that DR in front of it, then I'm going to him. That, that, that title describes he's a doctor. He's a doctor. Your title should just simply describe what you're called to do. Now, now come on. Follow me with on this. We've all seen people who have the title but are not doing the what that title represents. Come on. We've all seen people who have that title, but they're not, they're not doing the job that that title represents. 
And listen, that's in church, and that's in the secular world. Everywhere, everywhere. And you, you've got, listen to me, you've got pastors out there who aren't pastoring. And listen, and I mean this in a good sense, I know a few pastors that really should probably be evangelists because that's where their heart is. They've got the wrong title. They've got the, got the right heart, but sometimes they get the wrong title. Listen to me. You got worship leaders out there who aren't leading in worship. They may just be performing. Listen, I, man, even at our church, uh, instead of worship leaders, I'd rather have leaders that worship, amen? <laughs> we don't need more worship leaders. We need more leaders that worship. And listen, this isn't exclusive to the church, okay? It's not exclusive. We've got teachers who don't teach. We've got counselors who don't counsel. I wrote all kinds of things down. We've got managers who don't manage. We've got, we've got politicians who don't serve the people who voted them in. We've got governors who don't govern. We've got judges who don't judge with integrity. We've got police who don't police and protect. We've got servers. You ever been to a restaurant and had a server who doesn't serve? Right? I mean, I could go on and on and on, especially in a restaurant and things, but nothing is more frustrating than seeing someone with a title not functioning in that title. And that, that is just, that is, that is so frustrating. Um, let me share this. A lot of you know, that know me know this. I was a teamster. I'm not going all the way, okay? I was a teamster for 32 years, okay, for 32 years. Now, listen to me. Because I had that title of teamster, because I had that title, I made pretty good money. I had great medical benefits. I have a pension today because I had that title of Teamster. Now listen, listen. I worked really, really hard. I worked very hard. I worked very hard. But now, in that warehouse, it was very frustrating for me sometimes to see a fellow Teamster title not working. Not working. Not, not doing the job that his title carried, right? And listen, because he had that title, he knew he didn't have to do his job, okay? I'm sorry. I'm not bashing Teamsters. I'm thankful today that I have a pension and all of that. But because he had that title, he didn't function in it, though. He didn't function in it. How many of you know what a Teamster I should not say things that just come to my mind, but how many of you know what a Teamster gun is? Never buy a Teamster gun, okay? It doesn't work, and you can't fire it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Missed that one, huh? Maybe you get it later, too, though. Okay, listen. It was very frustrating seeing people with a title not functioning, not working in that title. And, and so here we go. What does all this have to do with God? What is it? That's really cool, Troy. That's good, all that. But what is all that? I haven't got a great scripture for you, but uh, sorry, I skipped one thing. One more conversation real quick. About two weeks ago, I had this conversation with somebody who said to me, yeah, thank you. I had this conversation, sorry. Okay, better. I had this conversation. We can cut that out of the tape, okay? I had this conversation with somebody who said to me, you guys meaning you pastors, you guys, you're, you guys, your goal, your goal is to get all of us, all of you, to become pastors. She was like, that's, that's kind of her, the mindset was like, your goal is to get all, everybody else to become pastors because that would be the ultimate. That would be the ultimate for all of you to become pastors. Can I be honest with you this morning? That is not my goal. Some of you are not called to be up here. Most of you maybe, okay? Now, I did not say some of you aren't called to be pastor because, listen, we're all called to pastor. We're all called to pastor, but maybe not from up here. And that's what, that's what this person was ensuing, that that would be my the ultimate. I could pat myself on the back if all of you became pastors. That's not the goal. Pastor means to... to to, I wrote it down somewhere where to go, to shepherd, to care for sheep. We're all called to do that. We're all called to do that. But listen, that's not my goal. 
that's not my goal. But in case you're thinking, whoo, good, we're off the hook. You're not, okay? You and I both have a, all of us have a title that is much higher than that of pastor. You see, because most of you that are here this morning, if not all of you, but at least most of you would say, yes, I'm a what? I'm a Christian. What is Christian? It's a title. You're wearing this title that says, I am a Christian. That's my title. I'm a Christian. We wear that title. And how many of you know what Christian means? It means Christ follower or it means little Christ. You're like little Jesus is running around. That's what the word means. Listen to me. This, this is going to be an ouch, but I'm warning you ahead of time, okay? There's more people choosing that title than are choosing the calling that title represents. Amen? Let me say that again. There's more people today choosing that title and not the calling that it describes. We choose the title. We want the title, but we don't want the calling that that title describes. <laughs> In fact, today's society, in today's society, we're trying to change the calling so that we can wear the title. Amen. Come on. We are people out there. You can be a Christian. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to, you don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. You can still wear that title. You don't have to do or be everything that that title represents. No, just take the title. Just take the title. You don't have to do all of that stuff. Watch what Jesus does. I told you I'd get to the scripture. Here it comes. Jesus feeds 5,000 people, probably more than that, but at least 5,000 people. They come to see him. Jesus is teaching this multitude of people. It gets late. It gets late. The people are hungry. You've got to read the Bible, okay? The people are hungry. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, send them away so that they can go get some food. They're hungry. I mean, you know what Jesus tells the disciples? I love it sometimes. Man, you got to read the Bible with a little bit of a sense of humor. Imagine you're the disciples. There's 5,000 people out there plus, and they're all starving. And, 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 and you, you come to Jesus and say, hey, man, those people are starving out there. You need to send them home so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus tells you, you feed them. And that's it. That's all he says. You feed them. I love it sometimes when I read the Bible. You feed them. You feed them. Now, now, who it was that I, I still got to congratulate the guy. Or still, this, this one disciple, I think it was Peter, finds five loaves and two fish with 5,000 plus people. But he still has the audacity, the nerve to say, well, Lord, hey, we got this little kid's lunch, five loaves and two fish. But then his faith kind of wavers. I don't know what, what that'll do. But he even had the nerve to say that. To me, that was huge, right? To me, that the fact that he even brought it up, hey, here's this, here's this. So, so, so Jesus takes the five loaves, the two fishes, sits all the people down, 5,000 plus. Some, pe some people said it could have been 10,000 people. Begins to break the bread. He prays first, breaks the bread, breaks the fish, begins to pass it out. When they're all done eating and they all ate until they were full, they gathered up the leftovers and I forget how many baskets. I want to say 12 baskets full. But here's the point. There was more leftovers than what they started with. Okay? So that's where we're at. That's where we're at in this story. Okay? Everybody has just eaten. Everyone's happy. Everyone's full. They've just seen this incredible miracle. And the people, the people are like, this must be the Messiah. And here's what they say to him, basically. And I'll get to scripture. Will you be our king? Will you be our king? John 6, 14. Then the people saw him do this miraculous sign, feeding all of them. And they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Sounds like the tree story, doesn't it? It sounds like the tree parable in the sense that, hey, will you be our king? And Jesus is like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And, and here's why. Here's what Jesus is basically saying. You want me to be your king and do it your way. You want me to be your king your way. <laughs> Sounds like Burger King, huh? They wanted a Burger King. I bet your way, right? He's like, you want me to be your king 
your way. And here, here's Jesus' response. I want you to see it unfold. Should I, here's what he's basically saying. You don't see this in the scripture. Should I stop producing what I'm here to do just to be your king the way you want me to be king? Should I stop doing what I'm supposed to be doing just to wave over you? Come on. Jesus knew who he was, didn't he? He knew he was what? King of kings and Lord of lords. No title was going to change that. No title was going to change that. And Jesus is just like, nope, <laughs> I'm out of here. And he, says, and, he just, and he just walked away. He just walked away. I, I, I wrote this note, and I, and I know maybe I was just in a hard, hard mood this week, okay, but I feel like one of the problems in America today is, is too many pastors have been made kings. Too many pastors have been made kings. Um, I won't say the church, and, the, and it was a great church. It still is to this day, and the pastor is a great man. If you know anything about me, you already know who I'm talking about. I got saved at a mega church, a big church. And, and I remember, and even when I was saved, okay, I was immature saved, but I remember when I was saved, if the pastor wasn't there on a Sunday morning, a lot of the people weren't there either. And I was one of them. I was, I'm just, I was one of those people. Oh, Pastor so-and-so is going to be gone. He's doing something, something. Hey, we can miss this Sunday. And most of the people, not most, not most, sorry. A lot of the people would miss if that pastor wasn't at church. Listen to me. And, I, and, and honestly, I know we don't have that problem here. It was, it was last Sunday. My wife did a phenomenal job, didn't she, amen? She did a phenomenal job teaching last week. And we sent out an email kind of announcing what the message is. And uh, I think Pastor Sam sends it out. And so I got the title from, from my wife, Lori. And I said, hey, I want to put, you know, Pastor Lori will be speaking. And she was like, nah, just don't tell them that, that I'm speaking. And I'm thinking, at least at Ignite Church, I'm thinking, no, babe, listen, our church isn't that way. If we tell them you're speaking, we'll probably get more people, okay? We're going to get more people there. But she's like, no, I don't want to give people an excuse or anything else. And, you know, and, and, and I love it because that's really not the way it is here. But, but here's, here's the thing. Number one, listen to me. Number one, I can receive just about anything from anybody that's up here. In the right spirit, you know what I'm talking about. I can receive almost, I can receive something from just about anybody that's up here. And number two, what matters is who's in here, not who's up here. Because the minute we start taking who's up here and give them a higher place than who's in here, you're already in trouble. You're already in trouble. Listen, if you're looking up here, if you're looking up here, and I mean this at Ignite Church and any other church across the world, if you're looking up here, you're in trouble. You've, you've already missed it. Listen, there is no such thing as a perfect pastor. There's no such thing as a perfect sermon. There's no, listen, and, I, and I've done this. Oh, man, I did such a bad job this morning. I did such a bad job last week. I did, man, that was, that was a bad sermon. Well, well, why was it a bad sermon? Well, you know, I, 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 I read my notes too much. Maybe I felt like I just read my notes too much. Or, or, or I, I missed the... I messed up on point number three. Oh, point number three was so good, or I was too funny. I wasn't funny enough. Um, all, all of these things, we start saying, oh, I messed up. I did all of these things. Listen to me. There is no perfect sermon. And, and I wrote this down. You judge a bad sermon by whether you obeyed what God told you to say or not. Okay? You want to know what a bad sermon is? When you don't say what God told you to say. And that's it. Holy Spirit is saving people. Not point number three. Holy Spirit is saving people. Not point number three. And, 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 and here, here's my point, getting back to it. Jesus is saying, you're not going to make me your king. I'd rather please God than take your title. I'd rather please God than take your title. To please you rather than God. He's like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Listen to me. This is for all of you that are here this morning. You have a part to play in the kingdom of God. Every single one of you. Every single one of you. And I'm going to show you that in a moment. But you have a job to do in the kingdom of God. That's the way God set it up. 
And I'm going to show you that, but here's here, here it leads to the second point. Never choose a title over producing. Never choose a title over producing. That may not make a lot of sense yet, but just hang in there, okay? The olive tree, the fig tree, and the grapevine. They all responded in this way. Me taking this title, me assuming this role, if it means that I can, if it means that I can no longer produce what God has called me to produce, they're like, you know what? Then I'm not taking it. You know what? Then, then I don't want the job. I don't want to do that. If it means me doing, if it means me not doing what I'm called to do, then forget it. Then forget it. Let me give you the scripture um, with this one. I'm going to have to play this one out for you so that you can actually see it come to pass. Okay. Um, it's in Luke chapter 4. Here we go. So he, he being Jesus, some of you are wondering why this chair is up here. Okay, this chair is up here for a reason. But, but imagine, I don't have the time this morning. Imagine this chair is down there with you, okay? So imagine this chair is down there with you this morning. So he, he being Jesus, he came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, as his way was, he went into the synagogue, he went into the church on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, to read, sorry. And he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, now here's what I want you to see. So Jesus comes into church, and he's, and he's sitting there. And, and, and it's time to read. I don't know if they called on him. He got up. Not sure how it all played out, okay? But he's just sitting in church, as was his custom, as is your custom this morning. I mean, you need to see this, okay? We, we picture this in different ways. He's just sitting there. And I don't mean this disrespectfully in any way. He's just Jesus, okay? He's just sitting there. And then he gets up. He gets up. They hand him a, the scroll. Sorry, this is close I got to the scroll. And he begins to read. And he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Kind of awkward, huh? Is that how you pictured this going down? Just stood up, read that scripture, and, and, and we skipped that part. And he went and sat down. And, and if it's, it's back there. And he went and sat down, and what happened? And that's about how I feel right now, okay? And, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Because you guys are all looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> what is going on? Awkward, right? This is awkward. I feel funny. That's what happened. He went up. He read that section of scripture. And the Bible tells us, give him the scroll back. And he went and sat down. But at some point, at some point as they're all looking at him, he gets back up. He gets back up. Let me get, get my spot here. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, so he got back up and he began to say, this is all he says. Watch this. Today, this scripture, what I just read, is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> See ya. See ya. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now watch this. This is important. Many, 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 many people thought and many people said, I, I don't know about that, right? When Jesus read that scripture and then he said, today this scripture is being fulfilled in me, the one you were all staring at, I'm fulfilling what that scripture said. And many of them thought and many of them said, eh, you know, uh, I don't know about that. They didn't even say it that nicely, okay? But a lot of them were like, 
I don't know about this. Now, this is Jesus' basic response. Here's his response. It's not scriptural. It's just follow my train of thought here. Jesus was like, that's okay. That's okay. But listen, anytime you find me, I got to make sure I get all these right. Anytime you find me, I'll be preaching the gospel to the poor. Anytime you find me, I'll be healing the brokenhearted. When you find me, I'll be giving sight to the blind. Listen, whenever you see me, whenever you find me, I'll be setting free those who are captive and bound and oppressed. Whenever you see me, I'm going to be proclaiming the gospel of the good news to the poor, proclaiming this is the year of the Lord. Listen, you can think whatever you want, but when you see me, I'm going to be doing everything I just read. I'm going to be doing everything I'm called to do. Because that's what God has called me to produce. That's what he's saying. That's what God has called me to produce. That's what I do. That's what I, he's telling him. Listen, uh, uh, he's like, I'm an apple tree. Don't come looking for oranges. That's what I'm called to do. That's what you're going to find me doing. And I love it. And we'll get into this in just a second. But it's like, and, and I want to share this with you. I want you to get this. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. You start comparing, you stop producing. You stop comparing, you stop producing. Um, I, I hate to single people out, but most of you already know, Pastor Toyin is an amazing prayer warrior. She is an amazing intercessor, prayer warrior. Listen, you come up for prayer and it's like, hey, what do you need? I got a headache. It's like, okay, come here. I'll pray for you. You come up for prayer and you're like, and I got cancer, diabetes, I've got a demon and I'm hooked on heroin. It's like, you need to go see Pastor Toyin. <laughs> okay. You need to go see. But listen, listen, listen. Hi, Stephen Furtick, amazing teacher. Most of you know who he is. That guy's an amazing teacher. But now listen, back to me in, in both senses. Should I stop producing figs? Should I stop producing figs? Should I stop producing what God has told me to do? Should I stop praying? Should I stop teaching? Man, that's what I loved about the fig tree. The fig tree knew who he was, and he was fine being a fig tree. He was fine being a tr fig tree. Listen to me. Be okay with God, who God has made you. And, man, I love this church, man. I love this church. You look around this church. This church is so diverse, et ethnicity-wise, if I get that right. Man, well, I think we've got a little bit of everybody here. Occupationally-wise, uh, I think we've got a little bit of everything. I, I love that fact. I love that fact about this church. But listen, be you and produce the fruit that God has called you to produce. That's it. That's it. Listen, and, I, and you're going to see it more and more. You saw it last week. But listen, somebody other than me might be up here teaching. Let them produce their fruit. Let them produce their fruit. Listen, I know I've said this a thousand times. Please don't check out. And oh, he always says that. Please don't. There are people only you can reach. I say that all the time because I believe that with all my heart and I know it's true. There are people, on, there are people Stephen Furtick will not reach, but you can. There are people, I don't know who's your favorite. T.D. Jakes will never reach, but you can. There are people you can reach that I never will be able to. There are people only you can reach. Listen to me. They won't listen to me. They won't listen to Rick Warren. They won't listen to Stephen Furtick. That's the way God works. That's the way God works. Produce your fruit. Amen? Produce your fruit this morning. Last, last point. Never choose a title over results. I love this one. Let me give you the scriptures. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus speaking. I love this. Jesus says this. I tell you the truth. Of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. That's Jesus speaking right there, okay? So follow me this train of thought. Do you know what Jesus said of John? Do you know what Jesus said of John? I just read it to you there. Jesus said, he's the greatest. He's this guy. He is the greatest. 
right? Do you know what John said about Jesus? He's the greatest. <laughs> okay, I'm just paraphrasing, but John basically said of Jesus, he's the greatest. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, his sandals. He's the greatest. Do you know what both did? Do you know what both did? Really not a difficult question. Do you know what both did? Exactly what they were called to do. Exactly what they were called to do. One last scripture. Watch this one. Matthew eleven eighteen 18 to 19. Again, Jesus speaking. For John didn't spend his time eating and drinking. And you say he's possessed by a demon. The son of man, Jesus speaking to me, the son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks. And you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. Here's the part. But wisdom is shown to be right by what? By its what? Results. By its results. They said, here's what he's saying. They said, John, they said, John looked like he had, looked like he was demon, but this is what they're saying. They said John looked like he was demon-possessed weirdo. And if you know, if you read the story about John, how he dressed, he ate locusts and all of these things, that's what people were saying. The guy, man, that guy's got a demon. He is one weird dude. Listen, and then Jesus says, and then I come along, and what did they say about me? They said, I look like a drunk, always pigging out, always eating, and hanging out with sinners. Here's the point. What was the result? What was the result? John proclaimed the coming of the Messiah. John called many to repentance. John baptized many people. Jesus, I was going to say Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is crucified for all of our sins. He rose from the grave. He's sitting in heaven and he's returning to earth. Didn't, listen, listen, here's the point. Didn't matter what they said. It didn't matter what it looked like. What mattered? The results. That's all that mattered. That's all that mattered. Let me tell you this this morning. I'm wrapping it up. That's all that matters for you and I, the results. And, it, and it's no coincidence. This story with the trees in Judges chapter 9, it comes after what? Judges chapter 8, okay? Real simple, okay? Judges chapter 9 comes after Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8, and Levi almost stole all my thunder this morning. Judges chapter 8 is the story about a man by the name of Gideon. How many of you know Gideon's story? I don't have time, so that's just let me just break it down for you. The children of Israel are basically in captivity. They're hiding. Their numbers have been reduced. They're hiding from the Midianites. The Midianites are, are, are just subjecting them to all kinds of things, persecuting them. So they're hiding from the Midianites. There's this guy by the name of Gideon, and he's hiding one day, trying to get food, so to speak. And it says that the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon. The angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and says, Hey, you, Gideon, you mighty man of God. Think about that. He's hiding, and his angel has the nerve to say, you mighty man of God. Now, again, I'm going to paraphrase, but this is, I, I got to believe this is kind of what happened. I am like positive Gideon, like, looked behind him, like, who are you talking to? And Gideon, Gideon basically tells the angel that. This, this angel of the Lord comes and says, hey, you mighty man of God. And Gideon's like, are you talking to me? And I think, the, and just read the story, Judges chapter 8, something like this goes down. I'll paraphrase it for today. I think Gideon pulls out this thing, says, hey, are you kidding me? Listen, I got my Ancestry.com right here. And my Ancestry.com, it says that, that my family, of the 12 tribes of Israel, my family was of the least of those 12 tribes. And he goes on and says, and my grandfather was the least of my family who was the least of those tribes. And he says, and me, Gideon, I'm the least of my family who is the least of that family who is the least of that tribe. And, and, and you know what the angel says? It's okay. It's okay. And listen, and Levi shared a little bit of this this morning, so I'm not going to get too much into it. You think that's bad already? It gets worse. It gets worse. The angel says, I'm going to use you to deliver the children of Israel from the hand of the Midianites. We're going to go to battle. And Levi shared it this morning. There was a different number than what I had. But there's anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 
Midianite soldiers. Children of Israel have 32,000 men. How many of you think that's a fair fight? 32,000 against 150,000. By the time Gideon goes to war, listen, he's down to 300. <laughs> he's down to 300 men. He goes into battle with 300 men. 300 versus, let's say, 150,000. Not looking good, right? What matters? Point number three, what matters? The result. The result. Gideon's 300 men defeat the, the, the 150,000 Midianites. And the 300 men barely had to fight. You should read the story. It's really good. Uh, Judges chapter 7 and 8. They barely had to fight. Here's my point. It, it's no coincidence. It's no coincidence that this parable is in chapter 9 just after Gideon was in chapter 8. And Gideon's like, I'm the least. I'm the least. You can't use me. Blah, 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 blah. And then this parable comes along. So what does this parable say to us? I promise you I'm wrapping it up. This parable says this. Don't settle for anything less than what God has for you. All of you this morning, don't settle for anything less than what God has for you. If you're here this morning, and I know there's some of you out there this morning. If you're here this morning and you're thinking, you know what, I'm just not that important. I'm not as influential as you, Pastor Troy. I'm not as influential as somebody else, whomever it might be. And maybe there's things that are not going so great in your life right now. I said right now because things will get better, amen? But maybe there's some things that aren't going so good right now. And maybe, maybe you like Gideon, you feel like you are the least. Here's my word for you this morning. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. God has created you for a purpose. Each and every one of you. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship created for good works in Christ, which God has prepared in advance for every single one of you to do. God's prepared in advance things for you to do. You're called to do something. You have a purpose. You have a play, part to play in all of this. Listen, if we're working to please people, doing and saying what people want us to say, we'll end up not producing the fruit that God has assigned us to produce. Amen? I'm done, I promise. Lori was sharing last week, got a little bit onto the last days, and I know we were talking at home about last days, and, and I'm not trying to scare you with last days or anything like that. Listen to me this morning. There are people you are called to touch. There are people you're called to reach them for the gospel. I can't do it. Rick Warren can't do it. Stephen Furtick can't do it. You're called to do it. Will you take that assignment seriously? Will you take it serious? And don't let the things of this world, don't let a title or somebody else come along and say, no, man, there's so much more. No, you do what God has called you to do. That's, if we, if we all do that, if we all do that, we're going to see this nation change. You're going to see your family change. And maybe you're out there this morning. You're like, well, I can't preach the gospel. I can't lead them in the center. I can't do this. You can get them to church. You can get them to church and then let me do what I'm called to do. But I can't get them to church. You can. And some of you can lead them to Christ. And some of you can lead them in the center. Pretty much all of you. Okay, but if you're feeling like, well, I can't do that. Do something. Do something. Amen. Do something. I look at this parable. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, Hey, you be our king. No. Just do what you're called to do. Just do what you're called to do. I know I'm going over time, but I got to share this with you. I promise this is it. So I'm all done with the message late last night. And, and as usual, I, I sit there and I'm like, God, what do you want me to say? And I felt like God told me, and I have no idea how I'm going to share this with you in two minutes or less. But God asked me this question and he said, Troy, are you the king? Are you the king? And I knew exactly what he meant. Are you the king? Am I the king over my life? And some of you are thinking, yeah, you should be. Yeah, no. He should be the king over my life. And I should be obedient and doing exactly what the king wants me to do. And honestly, man, when he, when he asked me that, it hit me hard. Because I know in... 
a lot of areas in my life, he is the king. He is. I also know there's some other areas of my life where <laughs> Troy's the king. And honestly, man, I had to just get real with God and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. I have taken on a role that wasn't mine, taken on a title. And in taking on that title, I'm actually not fulfilling what you've called me to. I'm not able to do completely what you've called me to do. So I'm closing right now, and the altars will be open in just a moment for prayer. But listen, I want to pray for all of you this morning. You all have an assignment. You all have a job to do. You all have a part in God's kingdom. There's people you can touch that nobody else will. And if you don't do it, it's on you, not me. <laughs> but I also want you to examine yourself today. Are you the king? Are you the king of your life? Are you happy with just waving over other trees? Or are you producing what God has called you to produce? And nothing, nothing else will get in the way. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the message. You can check us out on Instagram, Facebook, or online at ignitechurchoc.com.